Good morning, everybody, and welcome to day three of Operation Defend the North. Please join me in rise for the playing of our national anthem. Thank you. Thank you. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the members of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wet'en peoples. And this is now home to many diverse Inuit and Métis people. I also want to acknowledge for those that are watching online that the online space also constitutes indigenous space, given that our infrastructure runs across these lands skies and waters. My name is Ali Hirji and it's a pleasure to be your host once again, day three of Operation Defend the North. Before I begin, I'd like to welcome everybody, but also begin by welcoming the Minister Ahmad Hussain for a special address to day three of Operation Defend the North. Hello everyone, bonjour tout le monde. I'm Ahmed Hussain, Canada's Minister for International Development. I want to congratulate the organizers of CyberX Cybersecurity Tabletop Exercises because what you're doing is really important for our readiness against cyber threats. This is very much in line with our government's initiatives to tackle this uh, threat very seriously. Uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's leadership has resulted in our government introducing a new cybersecurity bill. And the work that you're doing today is helping us to implement the ideas behind uh, the cybersecurity bill. And events like these are important to continue to sharpen our defenses and keep Canadians safe and build a better digital future for all of us. Thank you for everything that you do once again. Merci beaucoup. Again for joining us. The session that we're going to start off with uh, will be approximate minutes where we will provide you a brief overview of where 
things are at today with regards to the attack on Northern Horizons power generation. I'm joined by my co-host Jack Brooks and Mark Dillon, along with leaders from across Canada and North America and the world. We have thousands of viewers that are watching online and I thank you. Thank you for being Take a second to update you on the format of how we're proceeding with our discussions. Along with the recap, and once we're done in about 20 minutes, we will then go into different modules looking at the impact on a variety of sectors before closing the day off, looking at restoration services, bringing things back up, um, and some collaborations that result as a result of this exercise. Three very important points to keep in mind. All of the players in this exercise are acting not necessarily in their capacity in their professional lives. So if someone's the CISO for a particular organization, they're not speaking on behalf of that particular organization. They are providing expertise. Secondly, this is a hypothetical scenario. There are some assumptions that are made. Periodically, you will see us bringing up prompts which guide our discussions. But this is a fictitious scenario that mirrors what could have happened in real life. And lastly, as you post your comments, the CyberX team is also making important notes. I advise all of you as you're watching online to not only continue your conversations in the live chat, but pay attention to what the scribes are posting as well so that you can recognize those timestamps because those, those reference some very critical moments uh, in our exercise. With that, let's begin the recap. Mark, if I can turn it over to you very briefly to discuss what happened technically yesterday and where are we at from the perspective of this breach that has hit Northern Horizons power generation. Sure, Ellie. Um, so there's a lot we don't know, but what we have been told as of yesterday is that the continued power interruption, which is now in its second, third, third day, right at the beginning of it, is a choice that the utility is making at this point because they don't believe that they can operate their, their grid and their generation safely because there was a supply chain compromise. What that supply chain compromise was, we don't know yet. We don't know if the initial outage was caused by an attack or out of caution was done proactively. Um, but we can expect that we'll be hearing some more information today about this. Thank you, Mark. And for those watching and those around the table, when we begin our next sessions, Mark will be responsible for moving the conversation along from a technical perspective in terms of what we are hearing from the utility companies and the authorities. Jack, uh, welcome to day three. From your perspective, as we go into this final day of our exercise, uh, based on what you saw yesterday, what were two or three very important moments that you think the audience and everybody around the table should be reflecting on? Yeah, thanks, Ali. Um, I guess maybe the first one is uh, that sort of strikes me is that you know, we, we talked a lot about the impact to other organizations not directly involved in the event and some of the things that they need to do to uh, to either protect themselves from this particular attack, which starts to move into other sectors or opportunistic attacks that might take place. Uh, and maybe unsurprisingly, I also really enjoyed the wrap up last uh, yesterday where we got a little bit spicy around cyber insurance. Um, and uh, I think the real takeaway there is that not all cyber insurance companies are made equal. And if you're going to go down that path, look for a partner that's really going to work with you versus just take your premiums. Thank you, Jack. And uh, just a reminder to everyone, we have about 18 minutes, uh, so let's uh, keep our points, just as Jack and Mark did, uh, very specific so that we can continue into the next modules. Octavia, you're joining us for uh, day three, and this is your, your first seating with us. From your perspective, what do you think are the two top things you need to know about the situation at hand? No, thanks, Ali. I think one of the things that I would definitely need to know is just where we are from a um, from a technical perspective with the actual utility company itself. And then also maybe what other things are um, adjacent that we may think that we need to be on the lookout for, um, what we should be looking for coming. Thank you. And, uh, and I really appreciate your, your presence here. This does reflect the reality of what happens when you're dealing with these scenarios where you bring in uh, as many people as you can to assist, and they might be coming at it at different times. So I appreciate your time today, Octavia, and thank you for joining us. Nadir, if, uh, if I can loop you in, uh, the team, uh, team Armis has been with us uh, for, for the majority of day one, as well as 
A2, we have uh, Team SailPoint here as well. Uh, we have CrowdStrike. We have a, a whole host of partners that are here. Nadir, from your perspective, looking at the fact that this is into day three, from a tech perspective, what's the priority right now for you, for the utilities companies? What do you think has to be top of mind for them technically as they're dealing with this scenario? Um, I think uh, if they haven't achieved yet a point where they feel that they can safely turn things on, uh, my question would be, do they at least feel like they've isolated the problem or not? And are they dealing with a scenario where they have any kind of interaction with the threat actor or not? Uh, I think that... Uh, Ultimately, they have to be, at, at day three, with this level of impact, uh, the priority has to be how do we get as soon as possible to resume operations safely. <laughs> so I would say that first, is it isolated? Like how confident they are that the attacker can't keep on moving or damaging or doing anything? And priority number two is uh, how well do they understand at this point the recovery uh, scenario that they have? Like how much of it is actually... Uh, relevant, how much of it can actually be enacted, uh, that, that would be what I would be thinking in their shoes. Thank you. And, and I will turn the conversation to Michael very shortly um, so that we can uh, we can also get his perspective as well as to Osman who are joining us virtually. I'll come to them very, very, very soon. Uh, Kush, if I can uh, loop you into this as well, you've provided us with a lot of perspective from a municipal standpoint. Now at day three, what do you think is going to be top of mind for the municipalities as they're dealing with the fallout from all of this? Yeah, I think I think uh, they're going to have to organize um, uh, specific areas in the city for taking care and looking after the people, and um, deployment of the of the specific police forces, ambulance, fire, it's all municipal. Um, as we talked yesterday, we have to deploy temporary shelters. Uh, so that folks could get information, they can get food, they can get water, etc. So it's very, very similar to a natural emergency like a flood or a pandemic, etc. At this stage in time, it's the same. People need food, people need water, people need the reassurance, people need a place to stay uh, temporarily, people need you know blankets, etc. Um, because so, so from a municipal perspective, they would really be in in, in action mode. And then what happens is when there's an emergency, uh, we you know we, we redirect resources. So if you work, let's say finance, well you're going to be redirected from finance into supporting the, the specific emergency. So there's a mobilization going on right now, where thousands and thousands and thousands of public servants across the country, on a municipal uh, sorry across Ontario, um, are being mobilized to go and help in the field. So that's that's actually a specific emergency plan that uh, most municipalities have. Thank you. Lena, if I can uh, loop you in before going to, to Michael and Osman next. Lena, uh, yesterday, one of the conversations that we had and George very eloquently suggested that now is the time to declare a state of emergency, not just provincially, but perhaps even federally. We did have some discussions about what were the concerns around doing this. And one of the questions that came up was maybe the concern is if you make too much of a show of it, it can mobilize adversaries as well. The question of terrorism kicked in as well. At this point, what's going through your portfolio as we're addressing this scenario? So there's a couple of things. We've learned a lot since COVID and because of COVID um, in how people approach authority. Um, there has been a an uptick in the distrust of our institutions. So how do we message that so that people understand that this isn't a conspiracy, this isn't another way to get them, that that's going to be critical because how we message that is going to be key. What first and foremost, you are looking at absolutely having to declare a state of emergency, but I think something to really consider is that this is no longer now an Ontario problem. This is not just a Canada problem. This is at now international because all our international partners are going to be looking at what is happening here and trying to bolster themselves. The other side of it is some of these um, industry and key infrastructure pieces that are getting hit have global implications. So whether it's flights, whether it's um, natural resources, because we are looped into other other countries internationally for that, whether it's water or anything else. So how has the impact on our power grid now impacted through a ripple effect, the international community at large, and how do we mitigate that? 
Thank you, Lena. And, and I will add for our audience that's watching is that we do have a dedicated module on malinformation, disinformation. Yes, 100%. Disinformation, which, uh, if, if many folks don't know, has actually been identified as a threat in uh, from a federal perspective. And there's a lot of literature around this that we will be covering. I'm going to queue up uh, our folks that are online. And uh, Michael, if I can bring you into the conversation. Michael, one of the things that you heard from, from both Adir and then also from the push is the mobilization of resources and technical resources at that too. Michael, from your side, what preparations is your organization potentially doing at this point to ensure that you have all hands on deck to support this technically? Michael? Technically, when you're in day three in the type of an instance like this, what you're specifically looking for is what systems are you confirmed the threat actor has, Michael, has access to? Michael, for a moment. Uh, sure. Yep, yeah, Michael, I think you can go ahead. Okay, so um, at the, I'll recap at this point. Uh, typically, at the, around day three and something like this, you're trying to identify and confirming which systems that threat actor actually has access to, and you're still trying to identify which ones that they might have access to. So having uh, visibility to all your assets is a key component to this piece, as well as uh, I'll add what Lena actually added to cooperation with international uh, communities. And for example, there is a joint US Canada initiative or attacks on critical infrastructure sharing information like that. So I would say identifying and sharing information with key partners is a, uh, is a critical component to get uh, getting additional intelligence of what the incident responders are going to have to look at too also. Thank you, Michael. I, I appreciate that. And it's something that uh, we will be uh, dealing with as we move forward. So I really appreciate your perspective. Usman, if I can uh, bring you in with your knowledge of the transportation sector, especially the aviation industry, we do have a module that will be covering specifically the impact on travel. What's top of mind uh, in your roster? Well, at this stage, in day three, we would be at a stage where it is it, we, we have a sense of what services uh, the airport can offer versus what services we're going to be temporarily suspending until this incident is re resolved. Uh, communication and, and public image is also going to be top of mind to address the concerns of stranded passengers. Um, the other uh, most important uh, aspect is around collaboration with external and internal stakeholders. With respect to transportation, there are so many stakeholders in in the works that make this operation run. And so by day three, we would imagine that we're at a stage now where after the initial scare and scramble of uh, deploying our um, internal teams, we are at a state now where we're figuring out um, what to do next. We're figuring out what uh, other services we can enable and how we can effectively move passengers uh, to where they need to go uh, and, and resuming operations as, as much as possible.
in addressing the incident as well as um, what, uh, what sort of our, our recovery methods or possible recovery plans. Thank you. Yep, and, and the recovery plan is, is, is again module eight. Um, not just about like like Mark brought up and Octavia brought up. It's not just about bringing back up, but bringing things back up safely so that this attack does not manifest in different ways and, and all of the controls that need to be there along with it. Kelly, um, you've also been a co-host with me. You've been seeing things in operation for, for the last two days. And if I could just ask you, for you right now, what is priority number one? One. Alongside knowing what's happening technically, what would be priority number one on your desk? Well, I'll, I'll give you two answers because one is really about the people. And I think about food now. I, I think how many people rely on food delivery that they're not getting. Uh, they're having food spoilage in their houses. And I'd say if, if we go back 20 or 30 years, people had a lot of food in their house that they could sort of sustain themselves for a week or two. Um, it's not the case in a lot of houses anymore. Or, or, you know, a lot of people don't plan that way. They plan to get food on a daily basis. So I worry about that side of it, that people either don't have the food or they have food that has spoiled. We're now at 48 hours. And so the health and safety of that. The, the other side of it is the restoration. I think about there's restoring the electrical services, but everything then that comes online, what is going to happen in that moment? So, you know, you take a small example in your house when you have a elongated power outage, a lot of times we go around, turn everything off so that when it comes back on, your house doesn't go crazy with the lights going, the TV, the, the router, everything going beep, beep, beep. And you don't want it to sort of overload and, you know, burn things out or cause other issues. This is now across all industries. And is that going to happen? Is it going to cause downstream impact of things that can't handle that surge? Um, and also, as we're bringing things back online, are we in the state of having a potential another attack? Yeah, and uh, ironically, yesterday in the chat, one of the questions that came up is how will the security teams uh, work well with, your, with the utility engineering folks that are there in terms of managing equipment itself and, and what's safe to turn on? Mark, if I can just ask, you know, that, that was a conversation that I saw yesterday online. And, and I want to ask you, what are the challenges in this situation us looking at it from a digital perspective, but your engineers, your, your mechanical engineers, and everyone else that's working on the ha hands-on at the utility center, what are some of the challenges in coordinating with them at this point? Well, it's likely that they're in all communications. will be disrupted. So they're, at this point, planning in a more physical way, I'd expect. Um, <clears throat> they, they might be having you know, morning, afternoon, evening meetings and planning things out. They've converted to paper maps at this point, which some of them might be out of date. Um, hopefully they know where all their assets are and they haven't lost access to uh, their digital inventory. We don't know exactly what was compromised yet. And I'd expect with an edge of this size, we're going to see a gradual restoration, but maybe some kind of plan for that. Thank you, Mark. Something that we will come back to. We've got about five more minutes and George, I want to leave you in before going to Bruce Bay and then summarizing with some, some takeaways. George, one of the uh, things that you've been an advocate for in this scenario is making sure that you're taking care of your teams in this situation. We cannot be working 24 by 7. We have, we have limits. We are also, as individuals dealing with this breach, also dealing with the fact that we are impacted by the power outage. Our families are impacted as well. This is an often overlooked reality, but in your perspective, what are some steps now that leaders need to be taking also that they're not burning out in this scenario and they're dedicating the right resources to the right requirements? Uh, realistically, you should be imposing a shift schedule. So you figure out your resources that you have at the table, break everyone down into teams, including yourself. You should have an on-call shift. Like you cannot be on call, especially as the person in charge. You'll have set hours where you're working. They might be four hour shifts, they might be six hour shifts, whatever it'll be. You're on for that time. And then you have an off period. If something critical happens, someone should get you, yes. But otherwise, that should be your downtime as the leader. If you don't have downtime and your batteries are fried out, you're useless to everyone. Additionally, with your teams, you should be having the same type of rotational schedule so that folks are getting downtime, they're getting sleep time, they're getting time to eat, 
They're getting time to disengage from the problem, as hard as that may be, but they just they can't be in the middle on the SOC or wherever your operation center is. They have to leave that room, go do something else for a few hours, then come back. If you don't have this rotational schedule and folks don't have a chance to, to recharge or sleep a little bit, we're at 48 hours now, yeah, your team's going to burn out. Your team won't even last 36. Your people are like, no sleep at this point, like from the Army experience, you're hallucinating. Like at this point, you you are literally ineffective to anyone. You're you're legally drunk. Your teams have to sleep. You have to sleep. You have to keep it in mind. Thank you, George. And, and this is something when we talk about the restoration services and what next looks like, something that I will bring up quite a bit, George. As always, thank you. And thank you for being here for all three days. Bruce Bay, you've had an acute eye on the national economic impact piece. That impact and that number is going up significantly. For our audience that's not aware of what does that mean, from your, from a cyber perspective, can you just share why that national economic impact number is important and where do you see it heading to? So um, from the perspective of the hit that we've taken, I just want to point out the ticker on the top left of the screen. It says $2.6 billion in 48 hours. And I think that's by a factor of 100, probably an underestimation. Um, I think <clears throat> we're in the hundreds of billions of dollars of hit right now. It's impacting our GDP, our overall productivity, and not just now, but long-term impact of it. It's going to take some time for us to come back and recover from this and fire and stuff firing on all cylinders. It's going to uh, significantly impact our international economical and financial uh, relationships, and not just with the systems that are down and transactions that are not happening, but long-term trust in the viability of the Canadian economy and how our partners, uh, both private and public sector, view us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ruiz Bay. Now, there, uh, if I can bring you very quickly into this conversation, you've been working across different countries, different geographies. You've dealt with these scenarios in real time as well. From your perspective, where do you see, I mean, we've heard Bruce Bay say that that number is, is grossly underestimated. Where do you see that number going? And uh, is, does it end? Does that number sort of come to a conclusion when the breach is under control? Or how, how do you see that number evolving? Um, I, first of all, completely agree with Bruce Bay. I think this is a gross underestimation. Uh, the reality is, especially when you think about the uh, definitely, if we take into account international ramifications, it's way higher. But even if you look just within the context of this attack, you don't need to look further than some of the other major attacks that have happened over the last few years, uh, be it uh, Change Health or be it uh, Colonial Pipeline or anything like that. The measure of damages is immense. I think that just the amount of money at Change, for instance, that was spent on cybersecurity operations and tools uh, dwarfs this number. Uh, and that's just one company in one scenario. So I think that the reality is that uh, it's hard to measure the overall impact. Uh, I think that it's usually known after the fact, but the uh, I think the underlying assumption should always be that this is uh, this is terrible numbers. And I think that preparedness in this sense is uh, not just uh, more cost effective and more effective in general. And these numbers are absolutely proof of that. Um, fixing the small things ahead of time is infinitely cheaper than dealing with an incident like this in real time. Yeah. Well put. And uh, we said this on day one that preparation is not a luxury but a necessity. Um, so thank you for that, Alir. I want to thank uh, Michael and Osman for joining us virtually and assisting with this, with this exercise and operation. My co hosts, uh, Jack. Mark, we have a long day ahead of us, but if I could summarize very quickly, I think the point that Octavia made is you know, knowing the impact to others and knowing what resources you have already deployed uh, will be very important at this point. If we table that with the, with the comment that was made by Andrew from RMS yesterday, which was the idea of you need to have that asset inventory now and you need to double check it, I think today we're going to be going a lot more deeper into that. And some of the other comments that were made in terms of the mobilization of additional resources, dealing with information as it goes out, dealing with policing, dealing with this at a federal, provincial, and a municipal level will all become uh, crucial conversations that we will have in our sessions uh, coming forward. With that, I want to thank you for joining us for the recap. In approximately 15 to 20 minutes, I'll be back with uh, our first module, which will focus in on the impact on travel, tourism, 
and hospitality. Thank you very much.